So let me get some idea of who is in this room. Uh, post backs, raise your hands. Post docs, raise your hands. Others. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Wasserman, and I've been at the NIH for a very long time. I'm in the Neurology Institute, and I am a clinical neurologist and interested in things like learning and memory and brain mechanisms, but my career took a huge detour into non-invasive brain stimulation uh, about 30 years ago, and I haven't quite, I haven't quite made it back yet, as uh, you'll see. And I, so I was asked to, to address this topic. Uh, Peter asked me to give a, uh, a brief and controversial talk. So uh, I will try to, uh, I, I will try to cover those, uh, those bases. Um, the first thing I want to talk to you about is transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is something I'm very comfortable with. We pioneered this stuff back in the late 80s and into the 90s. And in, in terms of whether it, it works, I'm pretty comfortable with it. So we have a, uh, we, we have a, we have a coil of wire with a very rapidly changing uh, electrical current flowing in it, which produces a rapidly changing magnetic field, which in turn will induce a, uh, an oppositely uh, flowing uh, in-plane electrical current in any nearby conductor, such as a brain. And when it gets into the brain, it creates uh, a virtual anode and a virtual cathode, and uh, where this where things are cathodal, uh, we can reduce the transmembrane potential in neurons and actually uh, open voltage sensitive uh, cation channels and produce action potentials. And this has been fairly well worked out. Um, so it, it, what magnetic stimulation really is, is a trick for getting electrical energy across the scalp and the skull pretty painlessly. And everything that happens after that is classical electrical nerve stimulation, which is something we're very comfortable with. The sort of coin of the realm in the physiology of transcranial magnetic stimulation is something called the motor evoked potential, which is what you can record from a muscle uh, when you stimulate the motor cortex. And this thing is very robust. Uh, it's multiple millivolts. Um, it is 100% reproducible and uh, represents the firing of uh, lots and lots of, uh, of muscle. Uh, so this is pretty real. This is about as real as it gets. And the nice thing about this is we can measure its amplitude and infer a great deal about what's going on in the brain and the spinal cord in its production. So, so far we're on very solid scientific grounds. We're, we're in, we as clinical neurophysiologists are very comfortable with this sort of thing. And we have inferred a site of action here um, through years of experimentation. Uh, it looks as though we produce this motor evoked potential in a muscle by stimulating uh, axons that are on the surface of the cortex and oriented in a plane parallel to the uh, stimulating current. There is at least one synapse here onto uh, a corticospinal output cell and a synapse in the spinal cord and finally a synapse at the muscle. And all of this has been carefully worked out. The observations are very consistent with this. So again, so far so good. We also have inhibitory phenomena uh, attributable to inhibitory interneurons in the cortex um, and uh, all very nice and easy to understand. Back in the mid-90s, we began to use repetitive trains of magnetic stimuli. And this is, these are data from an experiment uh, that, that uh, I was part of back then. And what we did here was to stimulate at 2 hertz, that's once every 5 seconds, and go dink, 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 and see no response here from the hand muscle. And then we put in a train of 10 pulses at 20 hertz, 
at 150 percent of this motor threshold, which is uh, formerly we were below it. This this is super threshold. We would not do this today because that's dangerous to do uh, at, at that combination of parameter values. But we've done something to the corticospinal output system here, and we are now this formerly sub-threshold stimulus is now super-threshold, and we are producing motor evoked potentials, which gradually peter out over time. We also observed back in those days that a little bit of one hertz, a little bit of slow stimulation delivered in essentially the same way, could reduce the excitability of that output system. Uh, here we're stimulating once every 10 seconds. We stimulate at one hertz here, and suddenly we're getting a lot fewer responses in this muscle. These are pretty robust phenomena. Um, they have been widely reproduced, but they have been even more widely cited and assumed when people make mechanistic assumptions in designing their experiments. And uh, so a lot of this has been uh, has, has been generalized to other cortical areas and other systems, and it may not be um, as valid as what you see in this very specialized motor output system, which uh, is unique in the brain. There's no other place that's connected to the spinal cord this way, and that is designed to send messages uh, a few feet to a, uh, to a muscle. So there may be something a little bit special about this, which is important to bear in mind. The situation begins to get murky, however, if you look at the community and what is going on. So this is a survey study from Simon Gandivia's group in Australia. And uh, pe people, these authors included, began to get concerned that some of these phenomena were a little bit hard to, uh, hard to reproduce. And they did, they did a survey. I think I responded to this. Uh, they got a they got a uh, hundred and some odd people to uh, to respond, and there were a huge number of file drawer papers. That means experiments that didn't work and that people felt weren't worth uh, the the trouble of publishing. So this is this is a very disturbing statistic. Uh, there were very few formal power calculations, which uh, may explain some of this. Uh, people, when they didn't get the results they wanted, tended to, uh, you know, an, an appreciable number tended to just add subjects uh, in order to get things to reach statistical significance. Uh, I assume most of you know that this is not to be done. Um, we, we do not do this. We do not test until we think we have enough subjects, and then we stop. Effects found as reported. So these are some uh, some other repetitive stimulation paradigms. Um, continuous theta burst is supposed to produce a decrease in uh, in corticospinal excitability. Uh, very hard to test in any other brain area because we don't have a good readout. Uh, intermittent theta burst is supposed to produce it, an increase in excitability. This is what I showed you before. Low frequency TMS um, seems pretty reliable. High frequency TMS also pretty reliable, the, uh, the phenomena I just uh, showed you. And there was no effect of years of experience. So someone like me, uh, who has been doing this for 30 years, doesn't seem to be any better at it than someone who has just uh, taken it up. This is more data from, uh, from that survey. Uh, and these are, these are really more <laughs> disturbing findings. Uh, this is, these are people who saw other people do it, and these are people who admitted that they do it, did it themselves. So screening for responders to a TMS protocol, that means if I'm studying, let's say, the effect of low-frequency TMS on the motor cortex, I will reject everybody from my study who hasn't previously responded to low-frequency stimulation with a decrease in MEP amplitude. Well, I mean, there, there, is a, there is a logic to that. If you're only interested in that phenomenon per se, 
Uh, I suppose you can study it that way. However, if you want a valid human sample, that is not it. Um, dropping data points based on a gut feeling. Well, we've all had those gut feelings, but I hope most of us haven't acted on them. Uh, this, is really, this is really shocking. Uh, excluding data after looking at impact on results, same thing. Uh, not reporting all experimental conditions, so we did a control, but it, you know, it showed something that we weren't comfortable with, so we just won't report it. Um, selectively reporting outcomes, um, that is, things that you measure, uh, things that you previously planned to measure. I'm going to look at the MEP amplitude, and I'm also going to look at whether people are happy or sad. We decided this in advance, but we just don't mention uh, one set of those data. Um, there's my pointer. There it is. Um, time points, subgroups, and rejecting outliers without statistical support. Something else we we do not do, or I hope I hope we do not do. So there is a big and robust literature out there, but if you count all of this stuff, and if you, if you assume that these data generalize to the rest of the field, then we, we tend to get a little uncomfortable about some of these claims. Uh, also, this, this is about motor paradigms, where we should be the most comfortable, there should be the most experience, and where the, uh, where the physiological readout is the clearest. Uh, but you, you can just imagine how murky this gets when we begin to apply these principles to areas of the cortex where it's harder to understand what's going on. Or measure, measure what's going on. Now let me switch gears and talk about TDCS, transcranial uh, direct current stimulation. And this is a technique where you put electrodes on the head and pass a weak uh, DC current between them and find amazing things. Uh, if you look at the literature, there are now thousands of these reports. Uh, this technique can do absolutely everything, um, and it never fails, uh, except in, in certain idiosyncratic uh, reports. So uh, these, are, these are weak currents uh, on the order of 2 milliamps. Of course, this is a meaningless number unless you know the area of this stimulating electrode because we are worried not about, uh, not about amperage uh, as a whole, but amperage per unit area or so-called current density. This is something nobody ever reports. Uh, because nobody understands high school physics. Now, when you set up this electrical field, there is very good science from individual neurons, brain slices, uh, you name it, showing that individual neurons should and do respond to being polarized like this. So that the science at the neuronal level is quite good. But the question is, what does this mean in the brain? And I'll try to explain to you why I think this is in some ways problematic. The situation in the brain, the typical setup is great big saline soaked sponge electrodes placed on the scalp. And this is the montage for stimulating the motor cortex with one electrode over the motor cortex and one over the opposite orbit. This is finite element modeling showing the circumferential current flow. And this, this ignores radial current flow, which may be extremely important as well. And the hot colors show you where the current is going. And uh, to no one's surprise, the current is following the CSF. Why? Because CSF conducts electricity. The rest of the brain is a pretty good insulator. The skin is a massive insulator. The bone is a very good insulator, too. And so most of the uh, current is actually shunted 
between these two electrodes, but what gets in is not under this electrode here. It's somewhere over here. And it's diffuse, and it's going in a sort of a sulcal pattern. Now, if you were targeting the motor cortex with this paradigm, you wouldn't be producing much current there. The other issue is that which side of a sulcus you're on is terribly important because of the directionality. And uh, so if you, if you have circumferentially flowing current, the leading edge of this, uh, of this sulcus here is going to see a lot of it, the trailing edge less. And if the other electrode is someplace over here and you're looking here, the two sides of the cell side are going to be seeing different polarities with respect to neurons that are, lo that are oriented radially. So if every neuron is sticking inward in a radial fashion, you're going to get the opposite polarity on the other side, which according to the underlying dogma of this technique should give you a mix of, uh, of antagonistic effect. However, this is what got us all excited about this technique. Um, people had been doing this forever and producing um, behavioral effects and, and a variety of things. But we began to believe it and get interested in it when it began to affect our old friend, the motor evoked potential, because as clinical neurophysiologists, we didn't believe anything unless it affected a, uh, a muscle twitch. So these are, th this is the first widely cited paper, and the paper that underlies all of the, uh, all of the sort of dogma on this, uh, on this technique. And what these guys found was that when they put, I remember I showed you there was one electrode over the, uh, the orbit on the right, and then there's one electrode over the motor cortex here. This is supposedly pre-motor. This is something else, and this is occipital. And this only worked here for some reason. And what they saw was that when the brain was polarized surface anodal uh, by, by putting the plus uh, electrode over the target, there was an increase in motor evoked potential amplitude. And when they reversed the polarity and put the cathode there, there was a decrease in motor evoked potential um, uh, amplitude. And this, this is actually, this finding makes some sense in terms of what we know about the basic physiology. And this group was able to reproduce this in lots and lots of studies. However, there was an earlier paper uh, from 1998, uh, which found the opposite. And here, uh, a cathode, uh, well, they, they alternated uh, anodal and cathodal stimulation, but found that it significantly depressed the excitability of the uh, motor cortex, showing the, the results are not, it's a little bit apples to oranges, but it's a very different finding. So there is a question uh, about whether these motor cortex results are reproducible or not. And a couple of groups have taken this on. And you should remember, though, that thousands of people are applying this unquestioningly to cognitive paradigms and, and all sorts of other things. So here are data from a group of subjects tested in four different sessions represented in these panels. And consistently, anodal, which is the way, the way we think it should be, <coughs> anodal polarization increases motor evoked potential amplitudes. So we're pretty comfortable with this. This looks, this looks pretty good as a group effect. <coughs> Cathodal doesn't work, um, and this is the experience of many groups, that they can't get the cathodal thing to work. Yet, remember, there are lots of people out there um, 
putting, cathodal, putting cathodes over cortical areas they're interested in because they believe they underlie some, uh, some cognitive function and saying that this disrupts that function. Therefore, whatever we find at the end of this underpowered experiment was due to the fact that this cathode disrupted this processing in this area. And here, I think most interesting of all are individual results. And here you have their 11 subjects, subjects 1, 2, 3, and, and so on. This is what happens in their sessions with anodal polarization. This is cathodal, and this is sham. Now, I got to tell you, the sham in these studies is not so great. What people tend to do is turn the stimulation on for a while. And when you, the, the stimulation on the scalp produces a sort of stinging, tingling, you know, a little bit like, uh, like licking a 9-volt battery, only less intense. It, it's a chemical effect that the skin is feeling. Um, the sham tends to be ramp it up, turn it off, and, uh, and supposedly subjects don't notice that it's been turned off. But, uh, you know, placebo effects are subliminal, and, uh, and, and sham here is problematic. However, their sham looks pretty good. Um, but, but look at some of these subjects who show increases in excitability no matter what happens, and others show decreases, and others show a sort of a mixed pattern. Um, so while anodal polarization, for instance, has a tendency uh, in the group to cause an increase in motor evoked potential amplitude. Uh, it's not a reliable effect, even within, even within some subjects. Here is another uh, study looking at the reliability of the effect. And what you're seeing here are group data. Um, for this is all anodal, okay? So we expect everything to increase here. We've got a two milliamp treatment here, and remember the amperage is meaningless without a current density. Um, one milliamp and a sham. And in general, these are these are time points after a brief uh, period of stimulation. And what you can see is that in two milliamps, you get a lot of significant. Uh, increase in excitability from from uh, from baseline. There is less for one milliamp, and sham doesn't seem to, seem to show much. So this is pretty good. This is evidence of a dose effect, which is something we really like to see when we're testing the reality of things in general. However, you got to remember that uh, the sham isn't so great. And it would be unlikely if people couldn't distinguish between the intensity of the sensation between 2 milliamp and 1 milliamp stimulation. Now, down here, these are the results across sessions. And you can see that each independent session looks pretty good here. Uh, it doesn't look as good here. And, and uh, here, there doesn't seem to be any effect. One represents a uh, no effect. Uh, between uh, between pre and post, no no change. They also looked at the repeatability within subjects, and these are individual subjects and their responses here. Uh, this is a meaningless jumble, but they came up with a clever non-parametric. Uh, metric of response that is controlled for the individual subject uh, difference across uh, difference in response ac across sham sessions. So it, it, it takes into account each individual's variability. And use, using this, they can classify responses as being there as, as being increases or decreases or no change in, uh, in MEP amplitude. And there is a greater preponderance of increases in the 2 milliamp group than in the other groups, again, showing a nice dose effect. But it only gets up to about 
and if you if you track individuals over sessions, these the size of these dots uh, represents the number of of, of subjects uh, so responding. People tend to drop out, so they're in session one. There are a whole bunch of increases, with some of whom drop out in in session two, and some of whom drop out in session three. So this isn't really it isn't real reproducible uh, even within individuals. So here is another paper from uh, from Simon Gandivia and his colleagues in uh, in Australia. This is about now about TDCS, and again, it's about motor findings. So um, not a lot of power calculations uh, in the studies they looked at. Um, however, respondents to their survey, 61% said they, they did a power calculation. Um, some had pilot data, which is really what we like to have when we do a power calculation. We want to know how this thing works in our hands. Uh, some used published papers, which is also OK. Personal experience, I don't know what that means. How the data are looking, not so good. Stop studies early for no effect. Stop studies early for effect. I guess you're allowed to do that, although you shouldn't. Um, you can do it if the effect is huge. But otherwise, you might just be, you know, you might just be lucky. And uh, people were adding uh, samples depending on how the data looked, and uh, many had no strategy. And in an, in a very careful audit of papers, uh, they felt that 93 percent of the papers they audited had no statistical strategy at all. Again, doesn't instill great confidence in this literature. More from this paper. Um, you, you can just see it. Adjust statistical analyses in order to optimize the results. Well, we all do a little bit of that, right? The data look like crap. Um, or the, you know, the sample is, is it, or it, it, we can't, uh, we can't get it to fit a normal distribution, then we do something non-parametric. That's, that's permissible as long as you tell people you're doing it and, and come clean about the reasons. Um, but uh, not reporting experimental conditions is not so good. Uh, this is a big issue in this field because these are squirrely effects and they take the magic touch, especially the cathodal thing, in order to get it to work. There are uh, the, uh, the first group to report this is, uh, is very good at it, and uh, they're very concerned that other people aren't. Uh, but they do tend to screen. Uh, gut feelings, uh, all of this stuff, relatively prevalent. I'm astounded at how many people admitted to doing this. Of course, it's anonymous, but I don't think I could bring myself. To, uh, because they, the authors would know who I was, and uh, that's just that's just amazing. So, more bad news. Um, and here are some nice reviews on the cognitive side here, and the, these were criticized and responded to extensively. People felt the methodology wasn't so hot and that there was sort of a uh, vindictive prejudice against some of these techniques. But uh, they're worth a read nonetheless, and nobody has come up with anything I've seen that has been particularly convincing in defense of a lot of the studies that, uh, that these guys trash. So um, just something to know about. And then uh, a couple of years ago now, the Mental Health Institute pulled a bunch of people together. They, they in extramural mental health, they're getting lots of grant applications uh, for TDCS studies, and uh, they wanted to know. Uh, Judy Rumsey, who's a project officer, wanted to know how they should uh, evaluate these studies. So they brought a lot of a lot of people together in a room, uh, including me. And just about everybody else here 
was it? I, I've published in this area. I've published some stupid stuff back in the early days. I tell you, I wrote not so great. And uh, but everybody else in this room was sort of a true believer. And the discussion centered on how to get better data, not on how to evaluate studies. So there was a lot of talk about don't put too much saline on your electrodes, and uh, you know that kind of that kind of thing. So um, I don't think this has really gotten gotten terribly far. Let me see what else I got for you here. Okay, so I this is my formulation of the transcranial stimulation problem. You put something on the head, be it a TMS coil or some TDCS electrodes, and you have in mind a mechanism. You are not a total idiot. You have read the literature. You know that when you put a cathode over the motor cortex, it causes the MEPs to go down. So obviously, it's going to make the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, do whatever the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex does a little slower. And then you find an effect because your study is underpowered and, uh, and it happens by chance and you have no way of, uh, you, you have no way of knowing that. Um, and then you, uh, you sit down and congratulate yourself and you say, well, the mechanism must have been right because the experiment came out the way we predicted. Well, your hypothesis was right. The hypothesis being, if I put this thing on the head, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex will slow down. Your hypothesis sort of includes this putative mechanism, but you didn't test it. So you can't really say you confirmed it, right? This is circular logic. And it's hidden and implicit in the way the literature works. Because everybody's going to read your paper now, and when I want to do something similar, or when I, when I apply for a grant and I want to buttress my claim that what I'm going to do to these people is going to work, all I got to do is cite your paper in Journal of Neuroscience as evidence that this mechanistic hypothesis is true. So what happens then? We propagate bullshit. And we, we all do it unconsciously, and we read uncritically. And if I'm a cognitive neuroscientist, I may not understand the nitty gritty of, of the physiology and the physics of this stuff. And the underlying low plausibility of some of these mechanisms. Uh, plausibility is terribly important. You, you guys know about Bayesian statistics and assumptions, right? In, in Bayesian statistics, we take into account the prior likelihood of something being true. Now, classic instance is in clinical medicine, where they say if you hear hoofbeats, do not assume it is a zebra because the prior likelihood of a zebra coming past your clinic is much lower than that of a common horse, right? So we, we, wanna, we wanna always think in terms of the, of, of the plausibility, the basic believability of what somebody's trying to tell us about mechanism. So what can we do about this? Well, you didn't think you were gonna get out of here without hearing about our wonderful research. Um, but here is a study we did. Now we had a little, I told you I was interested in learning and memory. So we had a little paradigm where we have a, a learning task. And if we did this continuous theta burst, which is supposed to, which 45% of people think decreases uh, motor cortex excitability, if we did this over the motor cortex, we could slow down learning. And this is actually a fairly reproducible finding. We had done it, others had done it. But we wanted to know what was going on in the brain. So we did it in the fMRI scanner. And in the following way, we took some subjects and we scanned them in two different sessions. Some of them got treatment. 
uh, right before they went into the scanner first and then got a on the second session got a sham treatment and we we flipped this over and then we we did some other testing and so we had a we had a, a vague hypothesis that this was doing something negative or inhibitory to the motor cortex and the motor cortex is intrinsic to this type of learning in, in some in, in some important way and we decreased its excitability whenever you hear that term and they're not talking about a direct physiological readout uh, it's it's meaningless um, but anyway we, we had this sort of vague idea and we wanted to see if we could refine it at all and learn something about the mechanism so post hoc we, we designed this experiment and what did we find we found when we looked at the con connective the the connectedness but how many of you you all are f familiar with resting state functional connectivity or task related functional connectivity peter is that which is which is good so using functional mri you know things are things are constantly oscillating blood flow is oscillating in the brain it's oscillating in every area of the brain and if you find if you look at two areas and look at the the temporal correlation between their oscillations, you can make an inference that these two areas are connected. And this, the, the R value for that correlation can vary. And things you can do to the brain change these correlations between brain areas. And this is really marvelous. I mean, this is a, a terribly powerful technique because we can, we can look at real synaptic change um, over time. So what did we find? Well, these blue colors are decreases in connectedness. So we found a decrease in the connections between the inferior occipital gyrus, a visual area, the superior occipital gyrus, and a bunch of areas oops, involved in motor learning, uh, including the premotor cortex the motor cortex and the supplementary motor area. And this was a non-biased hypothesis free search for areas that were changing in their, in their connectivity. And we found increases in connectivity between the anterior cingulate and areas like the, uh, like the superior frontal gyrus and inferior frontal gyrus, which are also involved in learning, and most importantly, the medial temporal cortex where the hippocampus is. So what we have done here is move connections from an area that is very important for procedural learning, for learning without uh, trying to remember the details explicitly, to a more explicit area involving the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus, which remembers events and facts. So if you make this area less efficient, it makes sense that there should be some overflow into this area as well. So this gives us a mechanistic idea that perhaps instead of doing something, instead of taking the motor cortex offline, which is how these experiments were generally uh, conceived of, uh, there is something in the literature called a a virtual lesion, as though we were causing a little stroke or something in the area we were stimulating. But that's not what happens. What we're doing is making a whole network a little bit less connected and breaking up the connectivity, connectivity a little bit in a bunch of areas that we didn't even stimulate, which is pretty cool. So immediately we learn something mechanistic, and we are no longer so doctrinaire about what's going on locally. And we are no longer so positive that the motor cortex is essential for this because it's the whole network. So you can learn a lot from functional imaging, which is why we are all here studying fMRI. Um, this is a better study, which we didn't do. This is uh, something that Joel Voss and his team published in Science. And this is my favorite paper in the world. Um, what they did was take a region in the hippocampus that they were interested in 
and use resting state functional connectivity to trace back to the area in the posterior parietal cortex that was maximally connected to this area. And then they delivered TMS to that area and looked at what happened to the hippocampus and areas it was connected to. Uh, they also tested for a certain kind of memory where you learn an arbitrary association between a word and a face and have to remember that. And the first thing they found was that memory got a lot better in their active as opposed to their sham group um, by the end of their treatment, which was five days, five days of repeated stimulation. And they, by the way, they used 20 hertz high frequency stimulation, which we think increases excitability. But what's most exciting for me and most relevant for this talk is that a network of sites in the back of the brain, in the uh, posterior parietal cortex, in the, uh, in the occipital cortex, and um, now the word, Jack, <laughs> what, is, what is that area on the inside of the uh, precuneus? Thank you. It, it, I read his lips. I, I didn't remember it. Uh, especially the precuneus. These areas increase their connectivity with the hippocampus like crazy. We didn't stimulate the hippocampus, or Joel didn't stimulate the hippocampus. He didn't stimulate these areas. But by accessing this network from somewhere else, uh, he produced this explosion in connectivity which correlates tightly with, me with the change in memory performance. Now here, we have a true biomarker of a cognitive effect. This is really important. Not only does it help us understand it, but if we were in the clinical world where results might not be this clean, we would at least have a, have a, a, uh, a biomarker of what they call target engagement in clinical trials. Um, proof that you went where you thought you were going and did what you thought you were going to do. Um, this is like, you know, when, when old guys like me take statins to lower our cholesterol, the ultimate goal is to prevent me from keeling over from a heart attack, right? But you can't really measure my heart attack risk. You can just draw my blood and see what my cholesterol is. Well, this is, this is like a cholesterol check for this technique. And this way, you know it's working. And you are kept honest. Because if you do not see this, then it's doing, it may be doing something, but it's doing something else. Um, another feature of this was that the pre, the, uh, the pre existing connectedness with the hippocampus was what determined the increase in, in connectedness. So these are a bunch of brain areas that are sorted for their hippocampal connectivity. So up and th this is the unity line. So this, this is just a mirror image of this. To the left and up uh, are, uh, are the hippocampally connected areas. And you can see this is where all of the, uh, all of the, in the, the intense increases in uh, connectedness after treatment reside. We have reproduced the hell out of this um, in, in our lab. This is, uh, this is the change in connection between the hippocampus and a region of interest that we defined based on the Voss study. LPOC C stands for lateral, parietal, uh, occipital, and something. Uh, and you can see that this goes up uh, when we stimulate the vertex, not the parietal cortex, as a control. It, it goes down, but not significantly. And when we look at the connectedness of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with this region of interest, there is no significant change. So we can, so this is a, this is a reproducible finding. And we can even reproduce this, uh, this connectivity matrix as well. So, uh, so we're pretty happy with that. And, the, and the, the bottom line here is really that if you have, if you have measures 
that tell you something about mechanism, you're on very solid ground. And if we had it, if, if, if people had these for other, for these other techniques and other applications, um, things would be a lot clearer. Um, but uh, that's, that's been a long time in coming. I have made a, a pledge that I will not do another study. I mean, this is now established. I think, I think we could take this and now use it blind because we've established, we've, it's been reproduced and we know a lot about how it works. Um, so, so you might be justified in taking this to a clinical trial, for instance, without doing fMRI, if it were, you know, uh, burdensome. But I, I promised I would never do another sort of basic study without a measure, without some biomarker of the, of the mechanism. Anyway, this is my answer to the question, uh, does non-invasive brain stimulation work? And uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'll take your questions if you have them. <laughs> the uh, question is, what sham are we using? We have used various shams over time. So in the first experiment I showed you, we used something called a sham coil, which is a TMS coil that clicks like a normal coil, but doesn't emit a magnetic pulse. This is okay, but not great. Um, the problem being that it doesn't produce the same sensation on the skin. So I think it's probably not a great sham. We, however, counterbalance that experiment so that People experience, some people experience the sham first, some people experience real first. So presumably any, you know, the, uh, the people who get real first notice that the sham is funny, but presumably since they had no experience before real, their results there weren't biased. So that is one way of dealing with a crappy sham. In the, in, when we reproduce Joel Voss's finding, we used identical stimulation at the vertex, which is the top of the head, where we have a feeling not terribly much of physiological interest happens. But people have used various things over time. They're, they're the, the best sham, I think, is probably a sham coil with electrodes under it that that stimulate the skin at the same frequency. And people here have played with that too. So, so the question is why test anodal and cathodal stimulation? Do you mean that in the sense of was there a pre-existing hypothesis about this? Yeah. Yes, so um, I don't remember the motivations of these individual groups. But there, were, there are data on single cells and brain slices going back to the 1960s on the effects of static electric fields, and in particular on, on polarity and orientation. Uh, so there was a scientific basis. There were also some whole animal experiments where they actually placed electrodes over the head of a, uh, I think a cat, with a with an open window to the cortex, and a uh, a cortical surface, or or perhaps a, a depth recording, looking at spontaneous firing of neurons, and they were able to manipulate the firing rate of these neurons, which I believe were in motor cortex, based on the polarity of the. Uh, based on how they polarized the cortex relative to some reference electrode. So those are pretty good data, but they come from very controlled conditions, um, which are a little different from the human situation. But I think that's enough. Uh, that would be enough for me to try this. Um, because there were effects of both in this basic literature. And in, and it, it it's confirmatory, I think, if you try one, one polarity and it does one thing and the opposite polarity does the other. 
the, the question is, where is this field going and where do I want to see it going? Um, it's going in many directions. So the, the work that I just showed you, um, the, the work combining fMRI and TMS, is part of, I think, a rebirth of these techniques, um, taking advantage of, of our capabilities now. And, and, and the, uh, I, I, I think it's, this has really revitalized the field quite a bit. Um, back, in the, uh, back in the 90s, Mark George and I, he, when he was, he was a fellow in the, in, a clinical fellow in the Mental Health Institute, uh, we got the or Mark got the idea that perhaps you could stick a TMS coil over the uh, over the frontal cortex in a depressed patient and make them happy, and this spawned an industry. I mean, this is now FDA cleared, and lots of people are doing this for money in the community. However, it's based on the old paradigm of stick something on the head and observe an effect. But this is all being re-examined now. And while I think there's a real effect there, um, I think now it's being, there was a real effect, now it's being improved uh, because of the ability to use functional imaging and, and other techniques to really sort of refine this and understand it better. So I think, I, I think at least the, the TMS field is, is moving forward in, in very interesting and, and more rigorous ways. Um, the TDCS field, I think, is, is wandering in the wilderness. Uh, it is moving into small companies who are selling sort of self-treatment devices. Uh, there is a great deal of that activity now, um, both for DC polarization and for various AC coupled devices with uh, with other claims, um, there is you know there are random noise stimulation paradigms and there's all kinds of stuff. The technology is so simple and cheap that it can't be controlled, and as long as you don't make any health claims about it. Uh, you, you know, as long as you just say this will enhance your experience of video games or, or something like that, the FDA won't regulate you. Uh, so I think it's leaking out into the community, and as it does that, it becomes harder and harder to study because there's just too much of it going on. I also think the effects are hard to capture, and I, I, I suspect this will become ever more part of the culture. Um, gizmos you can put on your on your head, um, some of which may work. I mean, there, I, I never once here said it doesn't doesn't affect the brain. Uh, so I think that's that's an important direction in which it's moving as well. Uh, what I would like to see happen, I don't know. I, I'm I'm torn about this. I think I think it's fine if you want to start a company and sell these these things. Uh, just don't hurt anybody. Um, for for what's going on in you know under protocols in academic centers, I would like to see things become more rigorous, and I would like I I, I would like to see a lot more physiology uh, to go with the uh, sort of cognitive and and uh, and clinical stuff. Is that is that a good answer? It was an answer. Not a good answer. Yeah. Where where do you want to see it go? <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. I, that, that's so that's a fair question. We're doing a lot of stuff with uh, clinical populations, so with like amputees. So for me, it's I think I'm just as much interested in kind of better understanding the mechanism of yeah. the effects. So connecting a lot of this to fMRI work. Um, yeah. Good. Yes. Uh, so. What does the animal literature say about? I mean, there because there you have the chance to go a little bit deeper into mechanisms. Yeah, so right. What is that? Right. Well, the TMS animal literature is worthless to date, and it's worthless because of the 
mismatch between coil and brain size. The spatial gradients uh, across an animal brain from even a very small miniaturized coil um, are, are very different um, than, than they are in humans. There is one exception to this. There's a guy in, in NIDA who has developed what looks like a really good animal coil uh, with a solid core. It's different, but it looks like he can do realistic TMS in animals with, with a fair amount of focality, which is pretty cool. He gave us a, a talk a while back. So I think we can sort of dismiss animal work in TMS. I don't think there are any good models at this point. TDCS is being studied very actively in animals. I haven't paid a great deal of attention to the literature, but I think that's a lot more valid. Um, but it's a little too easy to do. So if you want to, you know, if you want to look at the firing of neurons in the cortex when you, when you polarize the cortex, in an animal you can really, you can really control where that electrical field goes. And you can read where that electrical field is with, with electrodes. And uh, the experiments are very clean. Uh, you just have to, the, the, the human situation though is so much messier that I think you have, you have to be careful in translating those data. But I, this, is, this is mainly my way of covering my ignorance about, uh, about the animal world. Are we done? Yeah. Okay.